All right, well, good evening to everyone on this beautiful, if you're in the Northeast, cold breast Tuesday evening, afternoon, in the year of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2021, November 23rd. We are two days away from the feast of Thanksgiving. For those of us who know who our Lord and Savior is, we know that every day is a day of thanks and a day of thanksgiving. So we welcome you on tonight to Alden Baptist Church, located at 649 State Street, Springfield, Massachusetts, to our TNT, TNT, Tuesday Night Teachings Bible Study. I am L.A. Love, the pastor here, and we want to invite you to tag somebody right now, pull out your phone, text somebody, tag them, connect with them. If you're watching via Facebook and or YouTube or any one of our other social media platforms, <clears throat> we always want to invite people to worship with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so on this afternoon, as we get ready to get going, I want to put a couple plugs in before I get going. Uh, first and foremost, I want to remind all of our congregation and our uh, affiliates who are associated with Alden that on Thursday, this coming Thursday, at 12 p.m. from 12 to 2, Alden in partnership with Iona's Kitchen will be serving Thanksgiving dinner to go meals, drive through contactless, just drive through our parking lot. Our staff will be ready and willing and able, welcoming you with a smile, pop your trunk, open up your door so that we can place the meals in your car and you can be on your way. So we want to remind you to please share that information with all of your friends and family members that there is a place to get a meal for Thanksgiving on this coming Thursday, November 25th from 12 to 2. Also, uh, we want to extend a very, very happy birthday today to Deacon Alvin Whitmore. Today is his 21st birthday all over again. And so we know he is out celebrating, so he gets a pass on tonight. We know Sister Lou is doing it big for her baby, her boo, her man, Deacon Alvin Whitmore. And so uh, I, I hear he has a Facebook page, so y'all can tag him and tell him happy birthday on behalf of his church family. Uh, we would really, really and greatly uh, appreciate it. So we thank Deacon Whitmore, who is the chair uh, of our deacons, our outgoing chair, and that's a big smile he has on his face. He says, I got two more meetings, Pastor. And we're so glad for his leadership during the time of this pandemic. And uh, you know there's, 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 there's a special type of leadership that it takes um, during hard times and unprecedented times. And we thank Deacon Whitmore and all of our deacons and all of our leaders of Alden Baptist Church for partnering with myself as we keep as we keep Alden Baptist Church going during these pandemic times. Listen, I'm excited uh, about tonight as we get going. Please, please, again, tag somebody, invite them to worship with us on tonight. Uh, please hit that like and subscribe button as we get going. We want to thank all of you who are joining in virtually and all those who are here who braved the cold on tonight. We got one in the house. I wish you could see her. She got a mink coat on, y'all, from, 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 from neck all the way down to the floor. Amen. She, she looked like Sister, Sister Gentry from the, from the city, New York City, y'all. Yeah, got some city folks in the house on tonight. Listen, there's a great spirit in the house tonight. I thank God for your presence. Let us pray and go before the Lord in prayer as we dive into our Tuesday night teachings on tonight. God, we thank you for the spirit in the house. We thank you for the gift of laughter. God, we thank you for the gift of joy. We thank you for the gift of warmth and comfort. God, you have kept us to allow us to see yet another Tuesday night. For that, we say thank you, God. You've kept us all throughout today. The many activities that some may have had, oh God, all the stresses and the strains, and yet you kept us, oh God, on your mind. You kept us safe. You kept us sound, oh God, in the hollows of your hand. For that, we say thank you on this evening. Now, God, as we dive into your word, I pray, oh God, that you will hide me behind thy cross so that no flesh may glory in thy sight. God, I pray that your people will not see me, they will see you, that they don't hear me, that they will hear you, God. Open up your word to us tonight, God. Let us dive deep in the treasure troves of your gospel, O oh God. Pull out that which we are needing in such a time as these, so that we may have the strength to move forward and continue to live out our life on this side of glory, O oh God, with ambition, with faith, O oh God, and being able to help others be reconciled back to you. So we thank you in advance for what you have already ordained for tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. I also want to send a big shout out to my big homie, uh, uh, Minister Bobby Gentry, for holding it down these last two weeks. Uh, I am so privileged and honored to be able to have uh, someone 
uh, always in the wing and always ready. That is a studied man, y'all. He has so much information. I, I, I mess with him. I say, you have so much information that time you can't even get it all out. Uh, and so I, I thank God for him and his teaching. We thank God for Minister Giles uh, and, and Jonah two Sundays ago. Uh, amen. You can never go wrong with Jonah. Jonah touches everybody, big kids and little kids alike. Amen. So we thank God for those who are willing, able, and capable of always being at the ready and standing in, amen, in my absence. It's never been about me, and it never will be about me. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so we have some ready men and women who are always able and capable of breaking open the bread of life by way of uh, preaching and teaching God's word. Listen, we're back on track in our series on worshiping while wounded. I can't get away from it. I can't let it go. It won't let go of me. I've heard from all of you, uh, uh, quite a bit of you all on this series of how touching it is and how interesting it is, especially during times like this and, and the crazy times that we have going on uh, in our lifestyle. So on tonight, we continue our focus on reconciliation, yet through the lens of worshiping while wounded. With all that is going on in our world, such as the economic and political unrest residing near and around 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, including the Congress and the Senate, the social unrest due to injustices of jerry-rigged social justice systems that seem to protect its own. And let me put a plug right there because I want to make sure you don't miss this. I want to I want to make sure to get somebody's uh, thought frame right on tonight, set you back on the right track. Uh, and, and so I want to straighten you out tonight real quickly and right out of the gate. It is incorrect and downright delusional to think and to declare and decry that the criminal justice system is broken hmm. and incorrectly operating. Because truth be told, it, the criminal justice system, as it is in this country, is working exactly the way it was intended to work. That is to uphold, substantiate, and to protect land robbers, murderers, rapists, sexists, racists, and Napoleon complex type like people and those who know other than those who are of European descent. You know who I'm talking about, those who are male, pale, and stale. Yet it has become overwhelmingly obvious that the original intent of guardsmen, uh, where we have come to know them as policemen, uh -huh, were to discipline and to invoke fear in and to keep subdued slaves and the black community. Uh, and as it, has pers as it persisted then, it continues to persist today. And it is very much alive and thriving, if I may say myself, today. Therefore, the numerical, educational, and spiritual growth and the maturity of the black and brown communities are at the greatest threats of the prevailing unjust systems that we find ourselves underneath. Listen, to be able to worship while wounded, you must understand and identify your wounds. And we as a minority community, we as a black and brown community, we and those who are women who have been oppressed, depressed, and pushed to the side because of their female anatomy, we have simply come to a time where we've said enough is enough. And so worshiping while wounded is not necessarily confined to physical pain. Is not necessarily confined uh, huh, to, to, to health uh, disparities and, and health infirmities, if I may put it like that. Worshiping while wounded means that you can be wounded while yet black and or brown living in a country that does not want you here. I know this may not what you come to hear tonight, uh, but I, I want to I I help us enlarge our scope of what it means to be wounded. See, the problem is that when wounded is the one who wounds us, think if they can wound us, they can take us out. The problem with that is that while we're yet wounded, understanding whose we are, and understanding who we are and whose we are gives us the strength to move forward in some difficult times. Y'all know ain't nothing, I may use broken English tonight if y'all don't mind, ain't nothing new underneath the sun. This that's going on in our world today, this ain't new. We've been here before. We've seen this 
before. Matter of fact, we don't even have to uh, uh, go back here in, in, in the slavery days. May I take you to the biblical days in, in Exodus where it talks about uh, the slaves in Exodus chapter 1, if I can invite you tonight. We won't, we won't pitch our tent there, but I want to I open up here in Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, and, and it teaches us that while you are wounded, God can take your wounds and he can multiply your people to overcome those who are wounding you. Let me say that again. Exodus chapter 1 teaches us that while we are wounded, while the, the, the oppressor has his, foot, has his feet on our neck, while uh, they are trying to hold us down, press us down, God has a funny way of always lifting up his people in turbulent, trying, tribulating, and traumatic times. Here in Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, it reads, NLT version, These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon. Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. Verse 6, y'all. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers had died off. Doesn't that sound like us? Our civil rights leaders and our faux parents and all of them who had to go through the dogs and had to go through the to go through the, the fire hoses and all of them seemingly have already died off. And it says in that time that whole generation is, is gone. I like verse 7, Emilio, because it starts out with a conjunction clause, but. You know, anytime you hit a but, it takes you in a whole different direction. Uh, because verse 6 tells us all of them have died off, which indicates that their favor had died off with the last generation. But that but takes us into a whole another, a whole another direction. It says, but their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In other words, God never leaves himself without a witness. He had many, many descendants and many grandchildren. In fact, the Bible says, Watch this, y'all. They multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, uh, a, a new president, I mean a new king, <laughs> came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about the previous generation, knew nothing about Joseph or, or what he had done. Verse 9 says, he said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. Hmm. The king says in verse 10, we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war were to break out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from this country. Doesn't that sound like what we're going through now? Of, of a jerry rigged criminal justice system that's trying to, by God, with all of his power, still hold on to the little bit of power and authority that they have. Because if truth be told, research tells us, Buford, by 2030, 2040 at the latest, the majority now flips and becomes the minority. And the minority, which are the black and brown, now becomes the majority. The majority, all right? And so now there's a fear that the systems may, 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 may not be in the favor of those who first instituted them. So if you can lock up somebody who's alleged to steal a backpack and send them to Rikers Island for three years and yet let Kyle walk off who had an AK-47, kill two people, wound others, and walk off scot-free, your system is working in the way you intended to. But the problem is when God is involved, what the devil means for bad, I wish I had somebody. He'll turn it for our good. So, so the Egyptians, in verse, verse 11, it says, the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers. That sounds so familiar. Uh -huh. Over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build cities of Python and, and the Ramesses as, as supply centers 
of the king. They forced him to build the White House with black hand and black labor. I wish I had somebody. They, but, verse 12, there goes another but, y'all. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. Yeah, I stopped by this evening to encourage all of you as we continue on this service, on this series, worshiping while wounded, that despite the continued oppression, depression, the flat-out injustices surrounding all of us, we can be encouraged by knowing, like our ancestors, the more we go through, the more we grow while we're going through. It's the coined phrase of the iconic movie. Y'all remember in the early 90s, there was a movie called Baby Kids, and they said, we don't die. We multiply. That's just like God's children. We don't die, y'all, from one generation to the next generation. Even while wounded, we multiply. And as the devil tried to take us out, God has a way of continuing to repopulate his children on this earth. Therefore, with a telescope, telescopic type of lens to view regarding the power, the ability, the courage needed to worship while wounded tonight. In my best Pastor Tolan Morgan impression and or imitation, I summons your, I summons your senses and invite your intellect to the 10th chapter of the gospel of John on tonight where we're going to pitch our tent. All of that to say John chapter 10 is where we're going on tonight. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I see y'all online. Welcome on tonight. John chapter 10. Yeah, according to the gospel, according to John, by the theologian D.A. Carson, John chapter 10, the first opening chapter, verses 1 through 18, is considered the prologue or the introduction, and it is a foyer or entranceway to the rest of what is considered the fourth gospel, as we know it to be called as the gospel of John. Uh, simultaneously, this prologue, this introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, draws us in and introduces us to the major themes of this gospel writing. In this, in this writing of the gospel of John, John lays out uh, several things and several things that we can hang our hats on as believers that encourages us as we run this race called life. John emphatically, with no, with no minting of words and without a shadow of a doubt, he declares the pre-existence of the Logos or the Son in him, which is Jesus Christ. It is in him that we have life and light that is written in chapter 1. It is in him that even as the light of the world that he was rejected by his own. It is in John that John outlines and he lays out the coming, uh, the, the coming into the world as the light and Christ not being received by his own, uh, more or less being born of God and not of the flesh. John, with no uncertain terms, purpose of writing is to defend that Jesus is the Son of God. John writes and he outlines uh, that Jesus is the one and only Son. He is the truth in Jesus the Christ. No one has seen God except the one whom comes from God's side. Not only so, but many uh, of the central thematic words, according to D.A. Carson, of this gospel first introduced in these verses as the importance of having life, light, being a witness, the truth, the world, glory, amen, and the, in the intangible of understanding that Jesus is God and God is in Jesus. You do know one of the most quoted verses in the Bible is John 1 and 1, in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by him, God, and without him was nothing made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shining in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John emphatically, y'all, declares that the Word is God, and God is the Word. It implies that if I have the word in me, then I have God in me. And if I got God in me, I also have the word in me. The two cannot be separated. The two are the same, and there is no separating them. Furthermore, John, John's purposes for writing is to prove conclusively, and again, without a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that all who believe in him will have 
eternal life. Can I run down a couple of things as we pitch our tent in chapter 10? Listen, in chapter 1, all the way going to uh, chapter 2 to verse 12, John writes, and his emphasis is on the birth and the preparation of Jesus, the Son of God. Within that chapter, within that uh, 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 expansion of verses in chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12, Jesus does his first miracle. And, and I, I know, I know, I, I'm still chipped up on this too. Jesus does his first miracle, y'all, and his first miracle is turning water into wine. I got some witnesses in the house. I got some witnesses. He, he turns water, y'all, into wine. That's a whole nother lesson all on its own. Listen, in chapter 2, going all the way to, through chapter, uh, chapter 12, uh-huh, it's the message and the ministry of Jesus, the Son of God. Within those 10 chapters, Jesus encounters both believers and unbelievers alike. In chapter 4, Jesus has a meeting with the woman at the well. We're all familiar with that story. In chapter 5, Jesus heals a lame man by the pool of Bethsaida. Also in chapter 5, Jesus claims to be the Son of God. Chapter 6, a well-familiar story, Jesus feeds 5,000, not including women and children. Also in chapter 6, Jesus declares he is the true bread from heaven. In chapter 6, going into chapter 7, many disciples begin to turn their backs on Jesus. They desert Jesus, is what the Scripture says. And then leading into chapter 7, Jesus has conflict. God forbid he has conflict with church folks. He has conflict with religious leaders. That don't happen here at Alden. That don't happen here at Alden at all. In chapter 8, Jesus forgives an adulterous woman. Jesus has so much authority and integrity within himself, he doesn't even look at the accusers. The Bible says is that he bends down, puts his face in the ground, and begins to talk and tell them he who has no sin casts the first stone. The Bible says he spits in the dirt and he begins to write. And as he's telling them, if you don't have any sin, then go ahead and cast the first stone, stone this woman, and kill this woman. And the Bible says by the time he got through playing in the dirt, got up and looked around, wasn't nobody there. I wish I had somebody. That's a shouting point right there of just of of how good Jesus is and him him holding us while we wound. Can you imagine being that woman that the whole world seems to be against you because you have made a bad decision? Can you imagine that what she must have been going through as she faced death literally in the eye? knowing that if she was an adulterous woman, but it could have been some of them that she had slept with. That's a whole nother sermon all by itself. But Jesus has a way that when people want to stone us, people want to cut us down, people want to castrate us, throw us outside, people want to isolate us and tell us that we know good because we have made some mistake in our lives. Jesus has a way of putting some salve on our wounds by way of exposing the wounds of others. He, without sin, casts the first stone. Chapter 8, after he has that little meeting with the fellas, uh, he goes on chapter 8, verses 21 through 30, Jesus warns of the coming judgment. He concludes chapter 8 by declaring and defining uh, who the true children of God really are. Chapter 9, Jesus heals the man who was born blind. And then chapter 10, Jesus is declared the good shepherd. That's where we find ourselves on tonight. All that to say that we reside with a good shepherd, y'all. When dialoguing and discussing and or discovering how to worship while wounded, it is here in the 10th chapter of John that we pitch our tent tonight and find encouragement that will help us to not only get through trials, tribulations, troubles, and trauma, but also as we grow through it, those as we grow through those turbulent times by still being able to worship while wounded. John writes, and he's recording Jesus that Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. How can we worship while wounded? It's because we know that we have not just a shepherd, we got a good shepherd. The most quoted scripture in the Bible, according to some, is Psalm 23. The Lord is my, I shall not, let me back it up. The Lord is my, moving forward, I shall not. 
See, the good thing and the shouting point is, is that it, imp- it, it, it indicates that if he is my shepherd, he is my provider, and he provides for me everything that I need, including healing. It indicates that as a shepherd, his job is not only to provide, but to protect. Uh, that's where John can write because he, he, he almost is climbing on the back of the psalmist of David when he writes, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, shepherd time in the biblical days isn't like it is now, Buford. It ain't, it ain't like what you and I, this old country boy, as much as you're a city person now, it, you know, In the Bible days, a shepherd was really an honorable person. A shepherd was somebody who did not not consider it robbery to lay their life on the line to protect the sheep in which they were given. You do know where they found David, don't you? Tending to the sheep. Right. And 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 so here it is in John, John emphatically without any reservation, Jesus declares through John chapter 10 that I am the good shepherd. That's why I can worship while I'm wounded, because I have a shepherd that's providing and protecting me. So as we as we look at this, I want to pull out a couple of verses to help us help us understand this. For one thing, we see that Jesus is being portrayed not only as the shepherd, but as the good shepherd, and how good this shepherd is that will lose none of his sheep. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring, this is John chapter 10, verse 16. I must bring them also, and they will listen to who? My voice, so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. This shepherd is unlike any other shepherd. There is, and it is, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And if I have the authority to lay it down, I also have the authority to take it back up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This shepherd that John is writing about, uh he voluntarily, he as in Jesus, voluntarily lays down his life for us. It's like the old country saying that I used to hear my grandmother say, my mother said it, and I find myself saying it every now and then, is that they would say, I would pick peas behind mine. That's an old country saying, meaning that if I got to go to the penitentiary behind mine, and go out to the fields, then I'll do what I have to do to lay my life down to protect my children. And this is similar to what Jesus is declaring in John chapter 10, is that the sheep who are mine, every sheep does not belong to Christ. Watch it now in the text, because he says there are other sheep in the fold, right? It says there are other sheep out there. The question is, who do they belong to? Because if we are of Jesus' fold, it says here in John that my sheep know my voice. And another voice they will not follow. I wish I had somebody. So in this, John is breaking down Jesus' authority as a shepherd and his willingness to sacrifice his life. Watch this, y'all, for the comfort, for the comfort confines of his sheep to ensure they are protected, to ensure that they are, that, that they are provided for. And watch this, y'all, to ensure that they are going to the place that they have been determined to go. Hmm. Watch this, y'all. He says, there's other sheep in the fold. I want to remind you that there is something called wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> there is something called wolves in sheep's clothing, y'all. And, and, and they look like us sometimes. Before they know when to say amen. They know when to stand up. They know when to clap. Uh, but they're not there to pray for you, P-R-A-Y, but they're there to pray upon you, P-R-E-Y. And Jesus says, when I speak, I know who my sheep is and my sheep know who I am because when my voice goes out, they tend to react. To my preacher colleagues who may be watching on tonight, my pastor told me when I first got here at Auburn, he said, everybody that comes to church... <laughs> He said, everybody that comes to your church, you ain't they pastor. 
Some just coming. Others will willingly submit to your leadership and be willing to follow you as you follow Christ. Right? Watch this. The Bible says in John, John tells them that the good shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep knows him by his voice and no other voice will they follow. So in this, in verse 3, let me back up. In verse 3, it says the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Him as in Jesus, the shepherd. And the sheep recognize his, the shepherd's voice, and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run, they will run from him because they don't know his voice. Verse 3 is very important because it distinguishes between the shepherd and the under-shepherd. It distinguishes between the watchman and the shepherd. The watchman, or, or the under-shepherd rather, is the gatekeeper. And the shepherd only comes by way of the gate. Let me see if I can make that a little bit more plain. There's a sheepfold that belongs to the shepherd. We are his sheep if we submit to him and follow his ordinances. If we know his voice and follow his voice. That or this he calls his sheep and his fold. He has somebody who is standing at the gate, guarding the gate, considered the under shepherd. I'm considered the under shepherd for all. My job is to open the gate. You'll get with me in a minute. My job is to ensure to open the gate, not just for anybody, but for the shepherd. So that the shepherd can come in, he can speak with his voice, the Ruach of the Holy Spirit, and lead us to where he so desires us to go. Where does he lead us? Psalm 23 says he leads us beside still. I wish I had somebody tonight. Right? And so... As you look at John chapter 10 and being able to worship while wounded, you'll understand that you can worship while wounded because the shepherd is our comforter. The shepherd is our protector, and while we wounded, he's in the gate, y'all, with us. I don't want you to miss this. He's not standing outside on the other side of the pasture looking at his sheep. He's in the sheep fold with them. Here's why that's important. Because the gatekeeper, when trouble comes, the gatekeeper is susceptible to leave, run, and leave the sheep by themselves. Hmm. That's why you can worship while wounded, because the good shepherd will never leave you. Some pop off here, and my family is here. My first obligation is to my family. My first obligation is to get them out to safety. I love y'all all day. God bless you. May God keep you. I say that every Sunday as I end the broadcast. May God bless you. May God keep you. I'm susceptible of running off and leaving you if I, so I can protect my own because I'm a gatekeeper. I'm the under shepherd. I'm not the good shepherd, right? The good shepherd will never leave you. John declares in verse 3, he makes that distinction and, and that's very important because I say this a lot. You don't come to church to worship the pastor. You don't come just for the choir. Well, we have a choir stand full of what we just got a six-year-old baby trying to sing. That's not who we come for. We come to lift up Jesus. And so when we make that distinction between the shepherd, the good shepherd, and the under shepherd, you'll understand is that when you are in the shepherd's presence, you got no choice but to rejoice because you know he's there protecting and providing for you, irregardless of what's going on. Y'all still with me? Here, here in John, he outlines this and how important this is in verse 4 through 5. Um, he, he really identifies, and we must get the picture and understanding the difference between Western culture, culturalized shepherds and those of the Near East of the biblical days. Here's the difference. Shepherds that we grew up with in the pastures, we drove sheep. 
we drive the cattle from behind. Okay? You do whatever you got to do. Some of us have sheep dogs that run and nip at the heels from the back to drive them, right? But John characterizes and he describes Jesus as the good shepherd, Jesus and God, the two are the same or the one, as the good shepherd. And the, and the Near East version of a shepherd is that the shepherd leads from the front and the sheep follow him, right? So when you see a picture of a shepherd from biblical days, you'll see that they have something that looks like a cane, but it's called a rod and some others call it a staff. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me. Beside, uh, the, the Lord is my shepherd, he shall not want. I, I, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? He leadeth me beside the still waters. I'm paraphrasing. And then it gets down to thy rod and thy staff. What, y'all? Why does it comfort? It's used to fight off the attacks of the enemy. Not only the shepherd's staff in the, in the biblical days was larger and longer than the shepherd, so it gave the shepherd farther reach. So while, it, while he was leading, if he needed to turn back for one who was straggling, he could take the hook and grab them and pull them along with them. I wish I had somebody. In other words, while we are wounded and we feel like God is nowhere to be found, God uses his staff by way of the Holy Spirit to reach back and grab us and bring us not only to but through dangerous situations. That's how I can worship while I'm wounded, because I got God's hands literally on me, pulling me through difficult times. John describes it, and he tells him that this shepherd is a leader. Now, if he's leading me, my question is, would he not have known that I'm in turbulent times? Does he not know I'm in tribulation? Does he not know I'm going through trauma if he's leading? The reason why he would know is because he's the one who's leading me through it. Right? So that means that he's with me. He's leading me through it. And when I stagger, as I just said before, if I stagger, I slip, or even if I may fall, he's right there to reach back and pull me through. That's a good shepherd. Verse 10, John 10, chapter 10, verse 15 puts it like this. He says, or it says that, that, that the theme of it says that it shows that the shepherd voluntarily will voluntarily die and or perish, right? I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Hmm. I am, Jesus declares again in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know, evangelist gentry, my own sheep. And they know me. Verse 15, just as my father knows me, I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. This is really a prophetic declaring by Jesus from the sense of he's looking forward while yet pulling from the back. Because as he's looking forward, to the end time, he's also looking back of what Isaiah had prophesied, okay? As he's looking forward and helping us to look forward during our turbulent, trying, troubling, trauma, and all these bad times, 
he helps to pull us forward by understanding that he had already laid down his life for us. And that he is so good, why and how did he lay it down? Why did he lay it down? And what's significant of him laying it down? Right? While he was on the cross, and he quotes himself, while he was on the cross, that, he doesn't, that you don't take my life, I give my life. And if I got the power to give it, I got the power to take it back. If he wanted to, the Bible describes that he could have called legions of angels that could have came and unloosed them and took them down off the cross. Watch this, y'all. But he says, I and my Father are one. In the beginning, John says, in the beginning was the Word, all right? And the Word was God, right? So if the Word is God and God is the Word and we have both and or God and the Word in us, then that makes us one with God. And it makes us an equal, as the Bible declares, an heir to Jesus, knowing that we have the same power and authority. What am I trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you is that during turbulent, troubling times when I am wounded, I have the power and the authority to get through because Jesus has already died and sacrificed for this situation in which I'm going through. So don't get bogged down in it. Keep my head held high, my hands lifted up, my mouth full with praise, and know that he has already done what he needed to do for me to get through. That's why I can worship. If I can't even worship for myself, I can praise him for what he has already done on the cross as the good shepherd for laying down his life for me. Verse 10 through 11 are very emphatic verses. They, they, they speak to the shepherd's unrelenting desire to do whatever it needs to take to protect his sheep. It really highlights the true light, the true vine, and the true manner and the identity of who Christ is. Is that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep means no more than he is prepared to do so, not that he has to. But here's the thing about a good shepherd. A good shepherd understands that Buford, if he goes out of his way and dies, now he exposes the sheep. Mm. The good shepherd knows that if he goes out of his way and unnecessarily dies, now he leaves the sheep exposed to more trauma, more trouble, and the enemy devouring them. It's not that he has to die. He chooses to say, if I need to, I will. That's a good thing to have in your back pocket. That if come hell or high water, if Jesus needs to, he's going to do what he got to do for me because I'm his sheep. Everybody in this room have children. I would beg to say there's not one thing we wouldn't do to save the life of our child. When they wear our name, whether they've been married or not, blood of our blood or whatever it may be, they are mine. They belong. You can do whatever you want to do. Mama used to say, you can do whatever you want to do to me, but don't mess with mine. And that's what Jesus is describing here in chapter 10 as the good shepherd, is that although you may be going through what you're going through, it ain't that it's caught him by surprise, because if he needs to and when he has to, he's going to step in and take care of the situation as the good shepherd. So here it is in verses 12 through 13. He describes thieves and robbers. He describes these, obviously, as being wicked individuals. The hired hand, don't, don't get it twisted, is not wicked. Uh, he simply is more committed to his own well-being than to the well-being of the sheep. But verses 12 through 13 highlight the wickedness of wolves among sheep. Is that the job of the wolf is to scatter the flock. Yeah. The job of the wolf is to scatter the flock. Let me say that one more time. The job, the emphasis, what he is made, he or she is made to do is to scatter the sheep so that they may devour them. How can you determine a sheep 
from a wolf in the house of God if it's one who's always raising hell and scattering the flock. Keeping them at bay, keeping them pitting one against the other, scattering the flock, keeping the pastor busy while the flock is doing all this over here. John declares that when this happens, you ought to still be of good cheer. Because he, in verse 14, Emerio, he reemphasizes yet again. While pushing forward, he pulls from the back from the Old Testament. He uses the I am that I am. Verse 14, he declares, once again, y'all, I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And that's good and comforting news tonight because while I'm going through, how can I worship? Because God knows me. He knows my name. And if I put myself in the right position, in the right place to hear his voice, that's comforting news tonight. Because that means he's still around somewhere. When we were growing up, we were going to the Boys and Girls Club, and my daddy had trained us. He wasn't going to get out the car. 1972 Cutlass Oldsmobile, candy apple red, snow white leather seats. No heat in the winter, no air in the summer. But he had a distinct horn on the car. And as he would pull up, he would hit the horn. And I don't care what we were doing, we knew the sound of that horn. And he would only give you two. The one to let you know he pulling up. The second one, he was already pulling off. And, 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 so, and so because we became so conditioned to the sound of that horn, people made fun of us. <laughs> they talked about us. They said, man, them love boys is crazy. They, y'all better not, better not mess with them when their daddy comes. They know, they know. And that's the way what Jesus is, is that no matter what I'm doing, if, I'm, if my intimacy with him is so intimate and locked in, Beaver, that no matter what I'm going through, if I got to bury my child, if they put the locks on my house, if they repossess my car, if I lose all that I have, as long as I can hear his voice. You do know that Jesus' first healing miracle, he didn't use his hand. The Bible said he just spoke. So as long as I can hear the voice, there's power in the voice. There's change that will come in hearing his voice. Have you ever been in such a troubling time, you're about ready to pull out your hair, and all of a sudden you hear a still, quiet voice? And I don't care how hurt you have been, I don't care how sad you, you were, I don't care how many tears you cried. For some reason, when you heard that voice, you perked up, and some told you that everything was going to be all right. That's what John is declaring here in chapter 10, is that God, as the good shepherd over us who are his sheep, is that we can be comforted in knowing that God is around as a protector, as a provider, and as long as we put ourselves in a position and tune and incline our ear to hear his voice, everything will be all right. Here, as we work our way towards the close, John declares and Jesus declares yet again, I am the good shepherd in verse 14. And they know me just as my father knows me. Jesus is really indicating an intimate relationship of the two which have become one. So he understands, literally, he's unfolding to us his purpose, which was to be the sacrificial lamb. Then as we move through the scripture in John 10, verse 28 through 29, it shows us our security in Christ and in the Father. Is the reason why we can worship while wounded is because we're still secure when things seem chaotic. It says that my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life, comma, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. Let me say that again. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me. 
and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Jesus is declaring that irregardless of the wolves that may be around us, irregardless of the wounds that we may have, irregardless of the trying times that we may be going through in this country, is that we can smile, y'all, we can worship, because it's Jesus who really gives us life. And not only does he give us life, the scripture says he gives us eternal life. So this, as the scripture says, is yet but a moment of affliction. It's just a moment of time. Whatever it is, it's just, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Jesus declares, you ought to be happy and be able to still worship while you're wounded and while you're going through is because if you are mine, you will never perish. Because that wolf, that situation cannot snatch you out of the hands of God. Well, if it can't snatch you out of the hands of God, what is it really doing? Hmm. If it can't pull you from the grasp of God, what is it really doing? I remember one of my babies and my wife used to get mad at me all the time. Uh, because I had no regard for their life because I just used to be so rough with them. And... Um, I would take them in the mirror and I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd go, Phew. throw them up in the air. Phew. You know, you can, I can, you know, grandma looking at me like, uh, uh, you know. Uh, and if, if I can use that example, if life situations has us flinging in the air, and as a babe, you have no understanding of the danger in which you're in. And my little fat baby would be laughing and giggling and had no understanding that her life literally was hanging in the balance. That's what John is saying, is that while you may think your life is hanging in the balance, it's like Pinocchio, right, in the strings. You're still in the grasp of God. God won't let you slip nor dash your foot against the stone. That's why it's comforting to know that in regards to what I'm going through, what we're facing, we're, we're, we're anxiously awaiting the verdict of this next trial. Can I tell you there's going to be another one after that? And another one after that? And another one after that? And another one? At, but God still has us in his grips. And he won't let nothing destroy us. That's the comforting news tonight, y'all, is that we have not only a shepherd, we have a good shepherd. Jesus gives us that eternal life. That's the contentment that I was talking about on Sunday. It's the pleasure and being pleased and understanding that God has the last word. And we're all in the snatches and in the throes and underneath the grasp of God himself. Thieves may come. The Bible didn't say that the weapons won't form. It just said that they won't prosper. Because the thing about being in God's grasp is that when the fiery darts come, God is so big that wow, like I used to take my baby and I could fit her right here in my arm and she was a newborn, couldn't nothing get to her without going through me. That's the comforting news is that although I may limp my way back to God, although I, I may be leaning over, although I, I literally may have holes in my soul and in my spirit because of the wells and all the frails of life, God still has me in his arms. And I would rather be no other place than in the arms of the Lord. So on tonight, as John so eloquently has put it and made it without a shadow of a doubt. It's important to remember that in this, the fourth gospel of Jesus, in this unique, he is the unique son. And he describes to us and lets us know that yet while wounded, we can worship because the good shepherd has already taken care of everything. He's positioned and he's poised to take care of all threats, to take care of all wolves, to stand by you when the gatekeeper leaves and tries to protect himself. The good shepherd lets us know that we can have a smile on our face 
while danger is all around us, while the storm is yet still rising, because the good shepherd is a comforter. He's a protector and he's a provider. The good thing about the good shepherd is, is that when a sheep does get injured, he'll never leave him behind. If, it, if, if it's just one, the good shepherd would leave the flock to go get that one. And the comforting news is, is that maybe you're the one. Can I tell you, God is on his way to come get you. You may have to cry sometimes. You may feel like you're down and you're out. There's no turning. There's, there's no way to go. You, whether you look up, you look down, look left to your right, you feel all alone. Can I tell you, God ain't forgot about you. His staff, his rod is long enough, it's big enough to reach back and get you. I wish I had somebody that, that can be a witnessing warrior tonight to say, when I was down and out on Skid Row, whatever your addiction is, can I tell you, because everybody has had or have an addiction. Whether it be drugs, whether it be shopping, whether it be men, whether it be women, whether it be alcohol, whether it be your career, whether it be success, everybody has an addiction that at some point in time, it will wipe you out. But can I tell you, when you're down and out, you're in the perfect position to look towards the hill which comes with your help. And the Bible says all of your help comes from the Lord. So on tonight, I hope you were encouraged. I hope you were blessed. I challenge you to continue to read John 10 throughout the entirety of this, of this, the rainer of this week, even on Thanksgiving. Read about the good shepherd. Because you're able to sit around the table with your loved ones, or if you're still doing it virtually, you're still able to see them online or hear their voice because of the good shepherd. Is that when troubling times came, the good shepherd still kept the family together. During hard times, the good shepherd still kept some sweet potatoes, red beans, and rice on your table. I wish I had. You might not have a turkey this year. I hear they, they just astronomically priced out this roof. You know, out this world. You may not have a ham or what you're accustomed to, but you have something to be thankful for. And it's all because of the good shepherd. Amen. Listen, as we continue down this series, I want to give you an outline of the journey and where we're going. Tonight was John 10, the confidence that we can have because of the good shepherd that will help us worship while we're wounded and get from where we are to where God desires us to be. Next week, November 30th, we're coming out of 1 John chapter 3. The emphasis will be the confidence of our faith. We can worship while wounded because of the confidence of our faith. Tuesday, December 7th, we'll come out of Ephesians chapter 1, and we will talk about the confidence of our calling. The reason why we can worship while wounded is the confidence of our calling. Then we'll wrap up the series on Tuesday, December 14th, Psalm 103, the confidence, the confidence of the Father's love, the confidence of the Father's love. So that's the journey that we're down, and I hope this um, series is really encouraging and uplifting to someone. We do know that as exciting as these times are, the holidays, it is, it is dismal for some, and it's hard for some. Because of the loss of loved ones, because of still COVID-19, the high prices of gasoline, can't even get across town to see a loved one. We, we know that it's not always cheerful for everybody. We do know that we have elders that are all alone in, in nursing homes or, or within their buildings and, and, and residences of care. Uh, so, so be mindful of that. And as you get ready to celebrate and eat your turkey and your dressing and your collard greens and sweet potatoes and corn, cornbread and all that good stuff. I miss it. All that good stuff. I want you to be mindful of those who may not have what you have. And because the good shepherd has been so good to you, you ought to be good to somebody else. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you on tonight for John chapter 10, the good shepherd. God, you are the good shepherd. Beside thee, there are none others that can stack up or compare to you as the good shepherd. There may be some other shepherds, but you are the good shepherd. You are the one and only shepherd of your sheep, and we know you and we follow nobody else's voice but yours. To those sheep, oh God, who are wounded, who've been nipped uh, in the heel, God, who are limping their way through. God, I pray on tonight 
uh, that they feel your presence, that you have not forgotten about them, O God, that your wrath and your staff, O God, are big enough and long enough, O God, to reach back and bring them back into the fold. God, I pray, as you said in your word, your sheep know your voice. And so, God, I pray that you will, sh- that you will separate the sheep that are not yours. Separate all then, O God, from those who are not yours. God, I pray on tonight that those who are not yours, God, that they have an opportunity to get to know you, O God, and that they, too, one day may be considered as part of the fold. Lord, we pray over the gates, O God, that, that, that guards us and protects us along with you from all hurt, harm, and danger. God, we pray that you would keep the wolves at bay. God, that they don't sneak in, hop in, and, and, and jump the gate, O God, to attack us and or kill us, O God. On tonight, as we are yet... Oh, about a day or so away from Thanksgiving, God, we pray your blessings in advance, that we be mindful that we may not have what we want to have, oh God, we may not feel like we want to feel, but God, we have something to be thankful for. And it's not the turkey, it's not the dressing, oh God, the sweet potato pie. We, we are thankful for your son, Jesus the, Cro- Jesus the Christ, who went to the cross on our behalf. Oh God, he laid down in Joseph's borrowed tomb, God, but early Sunday morning, he got up, God, and we, we anticipate his return for us. And so, God, for that, we are thankful for your many blessings by way of the sacrifice of your only begotten son. God, we thank you and we love you. We ask for safe passage way for those who are here in person, that they'll be able to make it back home safely and soundly, oh God. Accident free, ticket free, automobile free from breaking down. And, Lord, we also bless those who are watching online, God, that you give them peace that surpasses all understanding, give them a sleep like they've never had before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Listen, we want to send another shout-out. Happy birthday to Deacon Whitmore. Also, if you're in the vicinity, if you're in the area, come get you a plate. Amen. From Iona's Kitchen by way of Alden Baptist Church on Thursday, 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Please don't wait till 159, all right? 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Amen. If not for you, remember a neighbor, an elder, a loved one, someone that you can bless with, with a plate, amen, from Iona's Kitchen so that they may have something warm uh, and joyous to eat on Thanksgiving Day. All right, listen, we love you. May God keep you. May God bless you is our prayer. Good night, you all.